Friends, welcome to Bridge Church. You can have a seat. Hey, I want to hear you hoop and holler for our students. Listen, I was, I was sitting over here with my wife kind of, you know, extrapolating forward into the future thinking, man, this, so this is generation now. How amazing, like think forward 10, 15, 20 years. These are the people in workplaces, in, in government, in families and in marriages and in parenting, doing it all in the way of Jesus because of how they are giving their lives to him now. And that is amazing. And hey, I just want to point out Jacob, his wife, Deja, all of the adults who so selflessly and consistently pour into our kids and students. Can we hoop and holler for them too? It takes a village, right? Those of us who are parents know that it is 119% impossible to do it on our own. Hey, I want to show you my family here and uh, just show you that I am doing, I am um, filling our student ministry with students <laughs> and do, my wife and I have done our part to fill the earth and subdue it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, this is my beautiful wife, Eve, our oldest Josiah, who you saw in the video a little bit ago, my 10-year-old Jericho, my daughter, Noelle, and uh, the one trying to escape who's being suspended in the air by my wife is our youngest, Jeffrey, whom we affectionately call Baby Man. And uh, he's... He's so fun. Anyway, look, my name is Jeff Lovin, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you this morning. My wife and I, my, my family, we're volunteers here at the church. We, we attend here, and uh, this is home to us. I, uh, in December, finished up a 17-year run on staff here, and uh, now we are thrilled to be normal church people. And, uh, <laughs> you know, loving and giving and serving the church as, as volunteers. And anyway, it's a, it's a thrill to be here with you all, and... Look, we are launching into a new series today in the book of Luke in the New Testament. Last week, we finished up a series that had been running since uh, Easter called The Man Series, looking at what, what the Bible has to say about men and how, you know, challenging men to, to live into who Jesus wants them and needs them to be and you know, maybe explain it a little bit uh, to all you ladies out there why we're so challenging and difficult and crazy. <laughs> And it was really great, man. If you missed any of it, you know, bounce over to our YouTube channel and watch those because they were, they were great. They were fun, informative, challenging, all the things that make for a good watch and a good listen. So you don't want to miss that. But we're, uh, we're about a year and a half in here at Bridge Church in moving through in our teaching topics, the New Testament chronologically in, in order of, of time when these books were actually written in history. And next up is Luke, right? So we're going to jump into Luke this morning, and uh, it's going to be great. We're, uh, what I'm going to do with us uh, today, hopefully, is with the help of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, set the stage for what is so compelling about this particular piece of the New Testament, and in the weeks and months ahead, as we learn from it together, our desire here at Bridge Church, our prayer, our ongoing prayer is that we would be challenged, we would be changed just a little bit each, each time that we we gather and we encounter this together. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the person, Luke, who wrote this, right? We're going to look at what he wrote, Luke, the book, and then we're going to look at the story within it, right? So let's, uh, let me just talk about Luke, the person here. And, you know, I, I have always been, and maybe some of you will resonate with me, I have always been the sort of person that when I come to anything that I want to read or I'm expected to read, uh, I'm always asking, who is this that's speaking to me? And why am I supposed to give them my time and my attention? And maybe that's just a, a, you know, a hidden arrogance or something in my life, but I'm always asking that question. And it's, for me, friends, it's no, it's no different with the Bible. So I'm like, who, who is Luke? Well, Luke, interestingly enough, is the only non-Jewish author of all the books in the New Testament. Why is that significant, right? So the Jewish people were the people that God chose out of all the peoples on the earth to have a special relationship with. So deep, so vital, so life-changing and compelling that all the other peoples of the world would see what is going on with God's people and they would want in. They would ask questions, they would be compelled, and they would want to end. And, and then that's what happened through the story of human history in relationship to God as people saw how God changed lives and they wanted in. They wanted to be part of something bigger and more than themselves. And 
All of the New Testament authors come from the people of God. They inherited their faith except for Luke. Luke chose his faith. And I think that is wildly compelling, right? Because here's a guy who saw from the outside, who knew what it was like to be on the outside, to see something different and to want in and to decide to become part of that movement of the people of God. And here he has, he has compiled and crafted all of this for us in a story that he hopes will change our lives too. Because guess what? We all, in our pre-Jesus lives, know what it is like to stand on the outside. And some of us wander in and wander out. And some of us have tried to be in our whole lives and we feel like, we're, like it's just confusing and difficult. But we all know in various ways what it's like to stand on the other side of the line and to be like, there's something happening there and I want it. How do I have it? And that's the power of Luke. He chose and he passed on to us what it was he discovered, the change that Jesus brought into his life. Now, a couple of practical things here. Why should we trust this guy? Who was he, right? Luke was a companion of a guy named Paul, often called the Apostle Paul. Uh, God used him. This is a, a, a Jew that became a Christian, a person of God that became a follower of Jesus, to write the majority of the books in the New Testament. And Luke was a companion of this guy, traveling around with him as uh, Paul was launching house churches that really formed the beginning of the Christian movement. And so Luke was there for a lot of that, even though he's not mentioned a whole lot of times. Throughout the New Testament, there are little, little snapshots if we reel, reel closely, but he probably met all the famous characters in the New Testament that we've come to know. And interestingly, he also ended up imprisoned uh, in a Roman city called Caesarea with Paul. So he knew the good times and he knew the bad times, right? And he still chose faith. Now, Luke was also a physician by trade. He was a doctor. And, you know, it's easy for us to take what we know of doctors in the modern world and, like, superimpose all of that on Luke. I I'd caution us. We don't know exactly what it meant to be a physician in the year 60 AD, right? But if this is a guy who has dedicated his life to trying to help other people physically, he's probably a pretty keen observer of the facts as he sees them in front of him, right? You gotta see someone as they are to know how best to help them forward. He was a doctor. He was well-educated, not everybody in the world this time, uh, was educated. It was, a, it was a world of mercantile and a world of family business and a world of tradesmanship. And to be educated in a formal structure and system was actually pretty rare. And Luke was highly educated. And, you know, if you ever uh, <clears throat> have many, many hours of totally disposable time on your hands and you choose to learn Greek, you could read this in the original language and you would see, or you can just take my word for it, <laughs> and you would see that the writing Luke does is excellent. It is sort of qualitatively different and better than a lot of the other writing in terms of its structure, its grammar. This is an educated guy who cared about research, and he was a keen historian. There's a part that we're going to see in a few weeks in, in chapter three where... <laughs> He, all he's doing is opening the chapter by identifying when in human history this event happened. All, all he needed to do was say, it happened then. But instead, he lists out six distinct identifiers, like this guy was king, and this guy was governor, and that guy was sweeping the floors, and this guy, was, like, and he lists them all. He just, he cared about this level of detail. And we're gonna come in a few minutes to see why that was important. Luke's an interesting guy, and so he compiled this book, right? And uh, what's special about, there's a variety of things, but one of the really special things about the Gospel of Luke is this was the very first account of the life of Jesus to be written down. So there are Gospels. Gospel is a modern word that simply means, it's a translation of the phrase good news. And a good news uh, in ancient times, in, in the world when this was happening, was a collection of stories about Jesus, a good news. And so we have four good newses in the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And Luke was the very first of all of them to be written down. And it was probably like about 30 years or so, maybe 32, 33 years after Jesus died. Jesus died in the year 33, and this was written in 62, 63, 64, something like that. So this is really soon, really soon after the events it describes. And in fact, the very first, we got many, many, many different pieces of Luke in ancient texts, copies, right? And the very first one uh, that we still have surviving today in a library is, is dated all the way back to 75, right? So this is old stuff, and we're gonna come to see why that's an important in, in a minute. But what we need to know about the book is mostly this. It was written by a guy who used to be on the outside of the family of God, who chose to become part of it as an outsider and to learn to be part of it. And it is written to people who continue currently to stand on the outside. In the beginning, we're gonna read in this verse here where he, uh, he actually addresses this book. He wrote this book to a specific person with an eye toward a lot of people. And this dude's name was Theophilus. And it actually, interestingly, it means lover of God. Uh, and Theophilus was very likely a high official in the Roman court, an outsider who was keenly interested in what was happening, the transformation, the life change in the Jesus movement and wanted to know more. And Luke took it upon himself as somebody else who didn't inherit faith, who chose it to provide for this guy, Theophilus, an orderly collection of Jesus and what it means to become part of the movement. And so that's what we have here. And perhaps my favorite thing about this book, um, I had the, the great privilege while I was in grad school to take an entire semester uh, on the Gospel of Luke. And it's a really neat, really interesting piece of literature, honestly. But perhaps my favorite thing about all of this is more than any other gospel, more than perhaps any other New Testament book, what we find in this one is that Luke takes great care to make sure as we read it that we understand that all of the barriers, all of the walls that we manufacture as human beings to determine who's valuable, who is not, who is in, who is out, who is worthy, who is not, who is clean, who is unclean, who's awesome, who's not, all of those things have been immediately, unilaterally, permanently, eternally demolished in Jesus and that everybody from every walk from every culture, from every ethnicity, from every lifestyle, from every socioeconomic class, men, women, slave, free, everybody has an equal seat at the table of Jesus. Ha <laughs> ha, so good. I love it because we need that. We need that right now. You know, we're, our kids, right, those of us who are parents thinking about student takeover, our kids are growing up in a world with just a, a wild amount of opportunity. You know, more, more than ever before living here in the United States. And also living here in the United States more just corrosively divided than it has ever been over things that do not actually matter. And in the story of Luke, we're going to encounter again what actually matters and I love that. I love that we're doing this. So let's actually jump into the story now. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the joy of launching a series, right? You're like, well, you gotta talk about the dude or the dudette who wrote the book and you gotta talk about what the book is. And so Pastor Andrew is like, hey man, I'm gonna be speaking at a conference. You wanna speak the 28th? And I was like, sure, of course. You know, I love talking and it's fun and I love being with the church family. And I'm like, so what are we doing? He's like, oh, you're launching my series. Awesome, that's fun, I'll launch the series. What am I speaking on? He's like, well, the first four verses. Uh, and then I read them, and they said, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So it also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. I was like, oh, gee, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> look, it, I, I, I kid, I, it's, this text is actually really interesting, but look, for those of us who choose to be people who read the Bible, right, frequently, occasionally, whenever, right, we get to the New Testament, and a lot of the books start this way, right? Let's just be honest, and we're like, 
nah, give me the good stuff. Give me the spot where Jesus is like working miracles and embarrassing in public the religious people and like throwing things around and snapping whips and, you know. <laughs> so let's, let's see what there is to see in here. And I wanna suggest, I would humbly submit <laughs> that in this funny sort of dry opening introduction, there are actually four questions we can ask of ourselves as modern readers and the answers to these questions actually have the ability to change our lives. I'm not talking about some like explosive mountaintop thing, like sending our kids to camp. Ha, let me tell you, pause, uh, commercial, um, please stop by the wall out there. Give something and you can know without a doubt that whatever you are able to give is going literally directly to life transformation in a young person. I grew up in the church, and some of the most pivotal experiences in my life trace directly to camp. My son had an epic experience at camp. Nine kids came home, got baptized. Like, seriously, this is what it means to work together and to have the village raising the child. So help us out, please. Anyway, four questions that can change our lives. Let's jump in and let's ask these questions. All right, verse one. Verse one. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative (laughs) about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Amen. What is it talking about? (laughs) The events are simply the things that Jesus did, right? The events that have been fulfilled among us, that's simply the things that Jesus did. And the reason he uses that language fulfilled among us is because he knows there's going to be people reading this who understand the historical trajectory of God's people, and that they're waiting for a special person to show up and do specific things to prove that they are the one sent by God. Jesus is that person. He did those specific things and thus fulfilled that expectation. So this is just simply the things Jesus did, and Luke is saying, look, there have been many people, a large number of people, an uncountable probably number of people, otherwise a guy this obsessed with detail would put it in there for us. They have undertaken to compile. Wasn't that a lofty phrase? They have undertaken to compile. They have been compelled by the story and moved to find a way to tell about it. Why, why do we have this strange language? I don't know about you guys, but like, think about balancing your checkbook, right? And you're like gathering all of the receipts from the week. You and your, your spouse or your significant other is like, oh, what are, you, what are you doing, babe? And you're like, well, I have undertaken to compile this week's receipts so that I may accurately create an account of the charges which we have incurred in the last fortnight. (laughs) Isn't the Bible funny? I love it, it's so good. (laughs) And people say it's boring. So, the reason we have these words is because they provide for us a level of intentionality. To undertake something requires intentionality because it's not a natural part of the decision flow of your life. Like, you know, a natural part of my life is to roll my tired, groggy butt out of bed and to search desperately for the coffee maker. I'm not undertaking anything, I'm surviving. You know, undertaking is like, I have decided to do this and I'm willing to expend the time and the effort and compiling, right? When we compile something, we we take the time and the effort to determine what's out there, to select from what's out there, to determine if there's truth in what's out there, and we put it together in a collection that makes sense. That's what it means to compile. So what do we gain from all of this? (laughs) Glad you asked. What Luke is saying is this, friends, this is an important story. So the question we gotta ask ourselves is, do I believe the story of Jesus is important? Of course, right? I mean, you know, for those of us that are doing our best to live the life of Jesus, to give our lives, to follow in his way, we're like, of course. Even those of us, I think, would probably, you know, if you're here and you haven't, you haven't joined the family of Jesus yet, you haven't given your life to him, awesome. We love that you're here. You could be anywhere, but you're here. Good on you for that. Welcome. 
Same thing on the broadcast, amazing. I would wager that because you're here, there's something inside of you that has pondered this question and desperately hopes that there is a positive answer to it, right? Of course, so let, let's drill down into this a little bit. Do I believe the story of Jesus is important? Do I believe, men, <clears throat> men, okay, here we go. Men, do I believe the story of Jesus is important like the events and stats of my football team's season? I know that story by heart, and I tell it. I know that my team made it all the way to the Super Bowl and I know the stats of the key players, and I know that we went to the very end of the game and that uh, we were tied, and I can tell you the score was 22 to 22 when the time expired, and then uh, we went down, and we did not do well, and then we gave the ball back to stupid Patrick Mahomes, and um, we know that story, right? <laughs> do you know which team Jeff roots for? <laughs> and we tell it. Or, or how about this? Do I believe the story of Jesus is important like the political events of the day that I very closely keep track of? I, I know that story and I, I often tell it because I want people to see things the way that I see them. Is, is the story of Jesus important like the events of the show that I am currently binging? We know that story. Like we can talk about the characters and the storyline and the <gasps> epic, epic moments and... The point is not for us to feel bad. Uh, you know, I'm making a little bit of light here to help us evaluate whether, whether we actually answer this question with the, the functions of our lives, our decisions. Uh, and the point is this. It's not to feel bad. The point is this, friends. We are moved personally by stories that we think are awesome, that we think are great, whether it's a sports story or a show or a political thing or a family or like a come from behind and win or someone overcomes a, you know, a life-threatening diagnosis. Or like we love these stories and we have an incredible capacity with the power of our brains to remember details, to recall them and to share them with others in an epic fashion. And that's what was going on here in Luke. And the question for us is, yep, each of us has different ways that our lives and brains are filled with grand stories, their events, their storylines, and we talk about them because they're important to us. Is the story of Jesus one of them? Hmm. I want to encourage you. If you are in, immediately in this moment thinking, hmm, I'm feeling a little bit ashamed of the answer that's coming into my heart at this moment. Listen, whenever we feel guilt or shame or less than, or devalued, that is never, ever from God. That is always from the, the weird mishmash of the enemy and our own insecurities internally because Jesus said, here's what Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. And that's what those sentiments and those emotions are about. I came for the purpose of life and that you may have it to the full. So, look friends, Every moment of every day is the next opportunity to move forward. So I wanna suggest that uh, we allow together uh, this story of Jesus that Luke is telling in the weeks ahead in this series to elevate the importance of the story of Jesus in our life. What do we do with that this week before next Sunday when we all gather again? Because the reality is the more important something is to us, the more it shapes our lives by default and by choice. I want to suggest that we just, we read the Bible a little more than we have been. No big, right? Whatever that looks like for you, read it a little bit more. And I want to suggest that we be here for this series, whether it's in the room, whether it's online, let, let's have some exposure to this compelling story and allow it to wash over us in a way that we, we are refreshed by its importance for us. Let's read verse two. Let's read verse two here. Just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed these events, these stories down to us. So what is going on in this one, right? Eyewitnesses, these are people who saw the story firsthand. These are people who were there when Jesus did the Jesus things. <laughs> and because they were so epic, right? They decided we've got to share these. We've got to hand them down. We've, we've got to make sure that we capture them accurately so that people weren't, who weren't here can understand what happened here. 
These were the servants of the word that the verse talks about. These people who were there and were like, oh, this is world changing. That person was dead and they're alive. We got to tell people and we got to make sure what we tell them is real and accurate and reliable. That's what the, the whole eyewitness, we still rely on this today in court. One of the primary ways that we come at evidence in a legal setting today, still in the Western world, is an eyewitness. And this has been the same throughout all of human history, right? We verify things by the account of people who are actually there. Now, let's, let's pause real quick and consider the skeptical perspective. I'm going to be honest with you all. Belief is not easy for me. Maybe some of you resonate with that too. I'm not the, I'm not the person who's just like, yeah, you said it's true? Awesome. It's true. Who reads the Bible and is like, cool, it's in the Bible. It's real. I've never been this way, and I'm still not. I struggle with that. And I'm the kind of person who comes to the text, and I read this, and I'm like, prove it. Prove it. So for the, for the folks in, in here who resonate with that part, I, I sympathize with you. I, I totally get it. And I want to say two things. The first being, don't ever, ever, ever let anybody who claims to follow Jesus make you feel less than for that because it's part of who you are and is part of the strength that Jesus put in you in defending belief. Okay? Second thing is you can do something with that. So in the case of a, the New Testament versus the stories we read about from verified professional educational documents, textbooks, right? We go to school, elementary school, and then junior high, and then really in high school, world history, ancient history starts to kick in. For those of us who were really into education, we went on to college, we probably had some, some world history as well. Look, those textbooks, right, are, are handed to us, delivered to us, we receive them, and we move on from those experiences not disputing hardly any of it. It's just like, look, we have this. This is how history took place. This is what happened. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, super, super. And we move on. Frequently, those textbooks, even at the world's best universities, are based upon one, two, three ancient documents and pieces of documents. And it has been collated, put all together, compiled to use the text, the language of the, the verse this morning, and we're like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. this is exactly what happened. And I'm like, what? When I found that out, it took me, I had a moment. I was like, you, you are telling me that you got two ancient documents backing up this entire worldview? <laughs> it was like the birth of the brain emoji. Um, the New Testament, right? The New Testament is pushing 6,000 ancient documents right, across all of it, and Luke is, Luke is in a bunch of them. And these documents, uh, in terms of like when they were created, like we have this, and then somebody called a scribe, an ancient writer-downer, <laughs> copied it over, and then another ancient writer-downer copied it over, like that's how it worked in the ancient world. We didn't just click duplicate on our files, on our computer. And uh, we have these for Luke, for the New Testament, Thousands, thousands of them across almost a thousand years, across three continents, across multiple languages. And you can pick one of these ancient documents from, let's say, the year 850. And you can go to the very oldest of the Luke documents from the year 75. And there's over 700 years in between. And do you know what you find? The same story with the same details and the same attention to detail throughout. Occasionally, there's a little like a, an S dropped away. <laughs> is it singular or is it plural? Is it synagogue or is it synagogues? But the stuff that matters and the vast, 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 vast majority of it is the same. And so what, what am I saying? To those of you who ask the question like I do, for whom belief does not just come easily out of the box, we can trust this. And the question we ask is, do I believe the story of Jesus is reliable? 
Do I believe the story of Jesus is reliable? Because reliability creates trust. And the things we trust, the people we trust, are some of the things that most shape our lives and they are the very things to which we constantly return for input. So do I believe the story, these are the questions I was asking you know, of myself, right? Do I believe the story of Jesus is reliable like my favorite news outlet? I trust that story and I return to it. Do I, do I believe the story of Jesus is reliable like the physical resources I've accumulated for myself? I trust those things and I return to them. Do I feel like, do I believe the story of Jesus is reliable like my best friend's advice? I trust him proven over 20 years and I return to his advice. Friends, I wanna suggest that we allow the story of Luke in the weeks ahead to help us elevate our trust in the story of Jesus. Do some research. Don't just take my word for it. I mean, I'm, I promise, I'm not just standing up here making things up. <laughs> but don't take my word for it. Like, go do some research on the reliability of this stuff. And then I wanna suggest, again, you're here. Be here with us for this Luke series. Be here with us. Verse three. Luke goes on to say, <clears throat> it seemed, uh, you know, it seemed good to me too. <laughs> Since I have carefully investigated everything, from the very first, from the moment of inception of the Christian movement, he didn't just like gather what was close to him and what was happening in his geographic region, his time frame, his lifetime. He went all the way to the very beginning and he investigated in a careful fashion all of it to write down, why? Why would you do that, right? That's time, that's money, that's effort, that's willpower, that's saying no to a whole bunch of other things that are probably awesome. Why would you do that? to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus. Why? Because as a former outsider, Luke knows how wildly confusing life with God and God's people can be, right? And he has a burden for this dude named Theophilus who is standing on the outside and wants in to be able to deliver to him a storyline of the life of Jesus that illustrates clearly with understanding, which removes confusion, why Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and why all the other stuff are just counterfeit. So the question we ask ourselves when we read something like this is, do I believe the story of Jesus is worth my effort Luke expended a tremendous amount of effort on this project, a great volume of his time, tremendous expense, physical resources, money, effort, probably some blood, sweat, and tears, and a whole boatload of saying no to other things that were probably pretty wildly appealing at that moment, so that the story of Jesus could travel another generation to people standing on the outside. We do that too, right? We pour our effort into things and people we believe are important, the things that have proven themselves reliable and trustworthy, and we keep returning to those things, and as we return to them, we return to them, we return to them, they shape our lives. Is the story of Jesus that thing? Do we invest our time into it? Do we invest our resources into it? Are there times when we say no to other ways of living, no matter how shiny and wonderful and compelling, so that we can say yes to the story of Jesus? Do I believe it's worth my effort, like my favorite hobby or activity? I mean, I, I pour time, resources, and intentionality into that story, and I don't even think twice about doing so. Is the story of Jesus worth my effort like my ongoing quest to get ahead in life? I definitely pour my time and resources and intentionality into that story and I, I, I do not question whether I should do so. Or how about, is the story of Jesus worth my effort like my most important relationships? Because I, I pour time into those. I pour resources, money, intentionality and I absolutely do not question the value of doing so. So I wanna suggest that we allow in the weeks ahead, the months ahead, this journey through Luke to elevate the worth of the story of Jesus in our life, such that from wherever we are currently at, 
We understand that it's important and reliable and we are moved to give it more time than we have, to give it more resource than we have, to give it more intentionality than we have. And as we, as we do those things, we answer the question, do I believe it's worth my effort? Yes. And as I answer yes and yes and yes, our life is changing. And we, we, we pause to look back and we see a trajectory of transformation that has not been there before. Be here for this series, friends. Be compelled. Get into Luke. And let's, let's round this out. Let's finish up with this final verse here. Verse four. Why, right, right? We're fair in asking the question, why, Luke? And his answer is, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed, so that you may know without a doubt the truth of the things that I have written down for your consideration. This story is true. So the question for us, do we believe the story of Jesus is true? This is the culmination of all the questions we've been asking, right? Important, is it reliable, is it worth my effort? I mean, all of these things coalesce into the primary question. Do I actually believe this is true? Our whole lives are just one endless string of searching for what is true so that we can build our lives on top of that thing that we find that is true, that can help us withstand the inconsistencies and the challenges and the heartbreak and the pain and provide for us a path forward. That is why we are constantly looking for what is true. Do I believe the story of Jesus is that in my life? Friends, the things and the people that we believe are true, those things upon which we build our lives, they are the things that shape us absolutely most. And I wanna suggest that as we journey through Luke this spring together, we allow the story of Jesus here that we find to elevate our belief that this is actually true and that we test it with the metal of our lives, that we make decisions that we wouldn't otherwise make unless this was true, that we spend time we wouldn't otherwise spend unless we believed this was true, that we use resource and realign some of our, our calendars and we, we dump intentionality in that we would not otherwise unless we believe this was actually true and we put it to the test because that's ultimately what Luke wants. He went to the effort so that we could experience the reality of its truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And I think a lot of us, we, we think about this question, and of course we want to say yes, and maybe we would say yeah, yes, I believe this is true. Well, if we want to be really honest with ourselves, and we want to really be accountable to ourselves, the way that we evaluate that is we take a real honest look at the things on top of which our life is built. People, relationships, money, education, corporate ladder, church in some cases. If the answer is anything but Jesus, well then there's, there's work to be done on whether we actually believe this is true. True enough to use it as a foundation. And I wanna remind us here as we round out our time together, the voice of guilt, the voice of shame, the voice of regret, uh, dismissive, less than, those are the voice of the enemy. What Jesus shares with us each moment of each day is a fresh opportunity to decide differently. So if we evaluate these questions and the answers are unpleasant to us, we do not have to beat ourselves up about them. We can say, yes, Jesus, it was different, the answers, than I wanted them to be. But as we move forward in Luke together, I am going to take different steps. And as I do, I'm going to build my life on you because I'm gonna do what I need to do to live in a way that shows I believe this. You are the truth. Imagine what will happen 
in our lives and in this church as we do that together. (laughs) It's good stuff. I'm glad you're here with us, friends. Let's pray. God, thank you for seeing fit to, to be a bit of a historian yourself and to provide things written down for us that we can encounter and deal with and and chew on and pull apart and help us. Help us to trust the gentle, positive voice you speak that every moment is a moment to be different. Help us to silence the other voices, uh, the competitors, and help us to decide together to be a people whose lives are built brick by brick, choice by choice, day by day, relationship by relationship on the truth. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, friends.